see you're alive. If you're still committed to the cause, DedSec needs you. I'll send you the coordinates to our last safe house. Meet me there. Fine. Auto drive now enabled. Auto drive now disabled. Auto drive now disabled. London has relied on the Metropolitan Police Service for peace, stability and justice. They weren't perfect, but at least there was some democratic control. Now there's a new sheriff in town. If you're a victim of crime or you just want to silence a peaceful protest, there's a new police force to turn to. Albion. And they're about as far from the old-fashioned Bobby on the Bee as it's possible to get. When Hassani handed over London to Nigel Cass, many people were surprised. But we weren't. London has been up for sale and privatisation for years. The only difference is that now the private companies have guns. So how did it happen? What does it mean? How can we reverse it? And what's the price of justice? On Buccaneer, we can seal everyone's full names for their own safety. Here's Helen, who investigates police, civil rights and justice in pre-crisis Britain. One of the kind of classic hallmarks of a, a fascist leader is having their own private army or police force. You know, it is in a, in a democracy, the state tends to have a monopoly on violence, and that's not what happens when a, a state fails. You know, you end up with people running their own private militias, and we've seen this all over the world. You know, every kind of great dictator in history has had basically their own jackbooted set of guys that they can send in to rough up people who annoy them. And that's the danger of a force like Albion. You know, you start taking powers to yourself, and actually, who is in charge of telling you no. It's always a worrying sign when you see, say, a president surrounding themselves with ex-military guys, with, you know, five-star generals or whatever it might be, because that sort of suggests that they want to run the country like you run a war. And in a war, you have to be incredibly hierarchical. You know, you have to be top-down. People essentially have to obey orders, because that's the only way that you can make that work. But that's not how it works normally in a, in a democracy. And that's the problem, really, is you end up in a situation where normal peacetime checks and balances are suspended and that's really scary. Is policing ever politically neutral? We spoke to academic Alfie, all names on the down low, of course, about the politics of law and order. 
I think it's very important to consider the changes that have happened in public space in London. I mean, the, the honest answer is there hardly is any shared public communal space anymore. Everything is privatised, owned by corporations and companies, and it's very difficult to, to feel that the space is our own to use. And essentially, you can be moved on from any area by forces which are employed to police the, the private area for corporate profit rather than for a community's overall well-being and shared livelihood. Um, so I think what you're looking at overall is a, a situation where it's now completely impossible to distinguish between a kind of state police or a, a police which operates in the service of the community and one which operates to protect private interests, which leads us to the situation we've got with something like Albion today. A private police force gives you a very different kind of justice to what you might have uh, in a former society such as one with a, with a state or government-run police force. And it makes you wonder if, you know, of course it's obvious with it when it comes to a, uh, an active police force, if it's enforcing the rules of the privatised state, then it's more likely to act in their interests rather than those of kind of ethics and morality for the greater good. But it also makes you wonder about the entire justice and legal system underpinning such a police force. You know, do the courts and justice systems also share the, the ethics and morals of the, the privatised companies who employ them and, and therefore, you know, is a kind of equal and fair ethics or justice completely gone today? So there we are. In Britain today, the police are bought and paid for. And there's nobody to roll that back but us. I'm Tash, and you've been listening to Buccaneer. We'll be back soon. Till then, you've got the knowledge. Now use it. Times are uncertain, and we live with the constant news of threats. But hasn't that always been the way? This island became great, not because of the good times, but how we dealt with the bad. From tighter border controls to investing in the pound, your government is taking the action needed to keep Britain safe. So when you meet someone who questions what we're doing, it's time for you to ask, why are they so worried? After all, if you've got nothing to hide, you've nothing to fear. SIRS, securing Britain to make things great. Today on the upload, we're talking about Sky Larson, the enigmatic founder of Broker Tech. Everyone knows her name, but no one knows too much about her. And we only really see her these days as a hologram. She was pretty young when she launched Broker Tech, the company that is best known for introducing Bagley to the world. Nowadays, it's hard to remember a world before Bagley. Bagley is the most advanced, significant AI of our time, and it's really blown all the other AIs that were created out of the water. And I think that what Sky Larson's done with Bagley is absolutely incredible. Yeah, I mean, I can't really imagine the optic without it. But what do you know about Sky Larson herself? Um, not a lot, other than that she's actually pretty incredible. Um, I've followed her work for a long time, and she's always been a pretty private person. I know that she supposedly grew up in the countryside, but there isn't actually that much more we know about her other than this tech that she's put out into the world. I've always found it a bit creepy that she's so obsessed with this idea of transhumanism. Why wouldn't you be when you've got a mind as amazing as Skye's? Why wouldn't you want to take what you've got and actually augment it by working with technology, by improving your physical self, changing your body and the world around you, implementing more technology to extend your life and really sort of extend human capabilities. You sound pretty much in love with Sky Larson, I have to say. I can't comment on that, but I am a big fan of her work. She's been one of these people that has transformed the world around us, and just watching how her mind works from afar is pretty incredible, because some of what the technology she's introduced has changed how we all live our lives, and Bagley has been this really incredible assistance to humanity as a whole. Did I ever tell you that I actually interviewed Sky Larson once? Really? I thought she never spoke to the media or anything so this was a long time ago back in the day when she was a little bit more accessible and she was one of these people that just had an amazing presence you were inspired by her very being and she was just incredibly talented and knowledgeable and one of possibly the best living people that I've ever met I'm not 
not sure you're being too objective there. I mean, I imagine she's not very likable as a person. She obviously despises humanity in some ways. I think she believes that becoming data is preferable to being human. She's one of these people who's extremely methodical in everything that she does, and she does everything to perfection and really tries to change the world around her and make it a better place for us to live in. If you say so. Immigrants, migrants, and illegals. Those are some of the words officials use in their public statements. Tonight on GVB, we ask, why won't the UK and EU use the word refugee? This is London Calling. You're listening to Buccaneer. Your source for what they don't want you to know. With me, Tash. It's hard to believe that there could be shortages of food and medicine in an advanced country like ours. And yet, here we are. Those old government promises of adequate food turn out to be just another lie. Today we're short of basic foodstuffs and vital medical supplies. Hundreds have already died of conditions that could be easily cured. The black market means that criminal gangs like Clan Kelly run our cities. And Prime Minister Dev Hassani isn't even around to pretend to care. How do we go from a consumer paradise to a place of empty shelves and fighting for supplies? What turns a land of plenty into a wild west of hoarders, food battles and black market barrels? We protect everyone who comes on the podcast by keeping their identities a secret. Here's veteran political reporter Ian on the power behind shortages. I mean, what was the first thing that happened when Britain sealed itself off? Like the first stuff that got stopped from coming in was fresh food. I mean, we could live without the fresh food. I mean, everyone's quality of life got instantly worse, but we could live without it. The most damaging part was when the radioactive isotopes stopped coming in. Now, radioactive isotopes, that's what we use in cancer screening, cancer treatment. Now, that stuff, it has a short half-life. Technesium saved, used to save hundreds of thousands of lives just by screening for cancer, let alone testing for cancer. But that stuff has a half-life of 66 hours. As soon as those walls went up, there was just no time to bring it into the country, and that is when people started dying. And then the medicines. The thing is, there's loads of medicines that you just can't stockpile. There was a, there was a moment before it took place when actually there were some efforts to try and stockpile some of the medicines. There were some things that could be done. For a lot of it, there was really nothing that could be done. We had a major problem with drugs for schizophrenia. So we saw such an uptick in the kind of attacks that you saw in the street and people suffering on their own because they didn't have the mental health drugs because those drugs simply couldn't be stockpiled. We eventually found the same thing with foods that weren't produced in the UK. And the trouble with the UK was we don't produce our own food. We we never had for hundreds of years and we produced under half of our own food so as soon as those walls went up we started having significant material problems in the country I mean, Britain always told itself it had this national myth right that it would because it got through the war that it could go through any kind of hardship I mean that wasn't really the case actually people during the war were far more frightened than, than some of this historical stuff makes out now what did we see people don't want to go through that stuff they were desperate for the thing things that they had before and they were scared so they went to the black market the same thing that always happens and where did the growth of clan kelly come from it came from people wanting the things that they could previously get legitimately and could now only get through the black market funneling funds towards criminality and from there we got to the situation we have now of this bit of war between criminals and security that seems to dominate what's going on out there on the streets Nothing shakes people's faith in capitalism quite as much as when capitalism fails to deliver. Here's underground writer and analyst Alfie, The Politics of Poverty. I think what we've come to now is, is a realisation that capitalism has essentially failed. I mean, the one key promise of capitalism that, that it makes to its citizens is that there will be surplus, that we will have plenty, and that that's the whole logic for, for running society in this way, that people will have enough. And now, uh, with these kind of huge shortages of everything, you're, you're seeing that system collapse. It hasn't delivered on its primary promise. And I think we've, we've really reached the situation where we have to do away with capitalism entirely. 
we're seeing a situation where there's there's shortages for, for the many, but for for a few individuals, there's a there's an elite who, who are not struggling yeah. and short of anything. So this is kind of fundamental inequality of a capitalist system, which is no longer pro producing the goods for most of us. Shortages are, are being used as well. I'm not saying that they're not there isn't a real shortage. There, there, there possibly is real shortages, but shortages are being used as an excuse to, for the. The, those in power, those elites, to keep what they want and not give to the rest of us what we need. So the excuse that there's simply not enough to go around is the justification for maintaining a kind of power of the 1% uh, and leaving the rest of us short. So if you're starving hungry tonight, if your parents can't get their medicine and your brothers and sisters have to steal to eat, remember, it's all for the good of Albion. Or Clang Kenny, or someone, just not us. But that's going to change. You've been listening to Buccaneer with me, Tash. Keep spreading the word and keep sharing the podcast. There's enough of everything out there for all of us. We just need the guts to take it back. The first summer without Arctic ice cover. Not long ago, the best predictions placed it a quarter century off. Today, we are facing the possibility it will be this calendar year. Tonight, GBB will be looking into what this means for the planet. The bug, nibbling away on the rotting carcass of a once free Britain. Yum, yum. yum. Hello, bugs. This is the bug. I'm Andy. This is Alison. Today, we're going to be pretending that everything is fine. Yeah, and back. Yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? That was as long as I could manage. That's mm -hmm. a second and a half. A reality time now, however. And, uh, well, finally today, we're going to road test the latest update to the CSA app, the government app that has brought the great British tradition of snitching on people you don't like back to the very heart of public life, the uh, school playground. I'm going to tell a new threat that's got a whole new lease of life these days, thanks to uh, CSA. And isn't Britain all the more fun because of it? No more grumbling about your neighbours playing their music too loud. Just simply report them to the state and have them, shall we say, in voluntarily rehoused at Hotel Cass, the uh, chain of hotels that was formerly known as the prison service. What was the slogan? Is it, if you see something, say something, or if you think you might at some point see something, say something, or if you haven't seen anything but don't like someone, say something anyway. Uh, so, well, let's have a look at this new app. Alex, I'm sure you've got it on, on, on your phone. I mean, at, at first glance, well, the interface is lovely. It's so neatly designed, a simple button to snitch on someone. That's so much better than non-government informer apps like Stool Easy, Can Can Canary, or Narc Shark. I mean, look, I just need to geocache where the person I'm ratting on currently is. Let's call her for the sake of argument, Alice. Uh, sorry, uh, Andy, I was busy reporting you to the authorities what, for rolling I... your eyes when passing a Nigel Cass propaganda poster. C could you not let me report you first, please? <laughs> Let's have some decorum about this. Um, I'll just take a quick little photo so they can get a drone to pick you out of a crowd at your next riot or trip to the shops or <laughs> walk, walk in the woods. Uh, and you, you can input input your accusations uh, with the app. But well, let's go old school. Let's let's call the phone line. Uh, let's call the phone line. Here's the number, uh, listeners, in case you want to dob someone in, as long as it's not me. Uh, 0044 203 807 3832. And don't forget to get the permission of the person who pays your bills before you call that number. Hey, I'd like to report my co-host Andrew, who runs an underground satirical anti-government comedy show, for running and co-hosting an underground satirical anti-government comedy show. Also, he does terrible puns. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, excuse me, I, I have a suspect for you. That is my co-host, uh, Alice. Uh, I have some evidence for you. She tutted audibly at the sight of an Albion vehicle in the street yesterday. She says she prefers pigeons to bloom drones. I mean, come on, seriously, when did a drone have a crap on your picnic? <laughs> yeah. And what's more, and look, I've no idea if this is true or not, but I have it on very good authority, so please write this down, that she owns not one, but two unlicensed fallopian tubes, whatever they are, <laughs> uh, but, but they sound dodgy. If I had a crypto for every time someone had reported my fallopian tubes, I'd have... Three, sure, I think it converts to about 120,000 great British pounds in the old money. We'll report back in the next episode about whether or not we've been arrested and interned. Uh, I mean, I love this system, Alice. I mean, no more awkward rumbling resentments with your neighbours, your colleagues, or what the heck, in for a penny, your family. You just dopped a bit and be done with it. <laughs> but I guess it could backfire. I mean, the thing is with the family, inevitably parents and their children, they end up squabbling. And, uh, you know, t today's Britain, your kids are going to dob you in, so you might as well get in there first and preemptively counter dob them in to the authority. Yeah. What's that number again? Let's call them up again. Hey, I've got, I've got someone else. It's my son. 
uh, l l let's call him Norris, uh, uh, he never tidies his bedroom, he gets up late, he listens to illegal non-government sanctioned music and is covertly plotting the downfall of the government and the restoration of a true democracy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just d define all your household chores as patriotic, and if they fail to do them, dob them in. <laughs> Problem solved. If you don't do the washing up, do you even want a clean British ethnostate? This is the bug on the buccaneer. Oh. Well, before we go today, Alice, let's delve into what we most miss about the old days. Uh, I'm going to kick off with uh, the flag. I never thought I'd miss the old Union Jack, but somehow our new flag managed to be even more irritating than that. I don't know quite what it is, if it's the, the new colour scheme or if it's just that it symbolises the loss of everything we once held dear. <laughs> but that flag irritates the hell out of me. It was everything you ever held dear Scotland? <laughs> well, that was something I held quite dear. <laughs> I miss being able to dodge my friend's destination weddings in Italy. There's nothing worse than being asked to spend the equivalent of a motorbike on some sort of boat-based farce in Sorrento. And I always used to really enjoy saying, oh, no, I can't afford it. Now they're all getting married in Brighton, and I have to go to that alleged beach. <laughs> it's made of rocks, Andy. If your sandcastle is an actual castle, that's not a beach. Uh, I'll tell you what I miss. I miss free will. That was fun. Remember that? I mean, was it an illusion all the time? Who cares? It felt fun. <laughs> I miss cash, particularly coins. I really miss coins. The fun of doing a heads or tails best of five to see if you had to go to the gym and then the best of seven, the best of nine, and, and I'll tell you what, that was, that was a long losing streak. Now with crypto, all the, all the romance has gone out of out of heads and tails. I miss romance, Andy. I miss there being mystery in life and not just a, a hope that your new partner isn't good enough at hacking to find out all the information the government has on you. Bye for now, bug fans. Keep feeding the kid in the resistance and one day it will grow into a Tyrannosaurus Rex that will use the Cass family as toothpicks, metaphorically, of course. After yet another death in custody, an increasing number of critics are accusing Albion of systematic prisoner maltreatment. Join us on GBB for a thorough examination of the conditions for prisoners in detention. You're listening to The Bug. May cause nausea, vomiting and headaches. You're listening to The Bug, the resistance comedy show brought to you by the Buccaneer Network. I'm Andy, joining me, as always, uh, Alice. I'm uh, excited to be here. Apparently, the resistance is uh, not going well. Uh, again? <laughs> well, there has been some news about DedSec, the resistance and or terrorist organization. Delete according to preference. Not preference, sorry. Delete according to whether or not you work for the government, Sirs, Blue, McKellys, or Albion. <laughs> according to a Sirs official, DedSec is no longer a threat. Uh, which I guess is true, in that it was never a threat in the first place. Reminds me of when my great aunt Gladys had her appendix out. Oh, Andy, that surgeon's a real threat, waggling that knife at me, trying to knock me out. Well, they're called a scalpel and an anaesthetic, Gladys. <laughs> anyway, if Sir's officials say DedSec is dead and buried, I guess we have to assume that uh, DedSec has never been stronger. But I do worry, Alice. I mean, sometimes I think... Is there any hope? Do you, do you still have hope? I don't think I'm allowed to have hope. We're living in the self-selected, algorithmically designated information equivalent of a propaganda state. And uh, every resistance that I've ever seen is weaker than the British pound. I feel like ho hope is an expensive thing to buy these days. Right. I mean, is it all, is it all totally pointless? What we got? I mean, it can feel pointless, but then again, I've spent almost all of my life doing pointless things, like watching sport, <laughs> thinking about sport, thinking about watching sport, learning French and hoping for a better future. All completely pointless. But yeah, I've done them, so we might as well carry on. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, yes, I think there is. Unfortunately, what is that light? Is it an oncoming train? Well, no, it couldn't be. Obviously, that train would be late or cancelled. Is the light at the end of the tunnel a burning effigy of the concept of hope? Quite possibly. Is it the soul of Sky Larson imploding into its own vacuum? M may well be that. <laughs> is it the ego of Nigel Cass that is now so big that it sucked all the light in the universe into itself? I think that it is most, most likely is that, but... We'll never give up, bug fans. This resistance will never die. And one day, we will again be free. Free from these technological chains, free to choose our own futures, free to live our own lives, free to waste our time watching people bake cakes and dance badly again. Those were the days. Over and out. Before we go, time for a quick bug off. I'm going to nominate this week Sky Larson here at the bug. We are all in favour of strong, powerful women. And in many ways, Sky is the ultimate feminist icon, proving that women can do just as abominably awful things to this planet as men. <laughs> uh, I mean, overall, Alice, I think, I think we're still ahead as men, but you lot are catching up. Fair play. Fair play to you. 
You are listening to the bar. This is London Calling. You're listening to me, Tash, on Buccaneer. Your source for what they don't want you to know. This time we're turning our focus back on the media to look at my former employer, the GBB. As we know, the broadcaster has been through a lot of changes since the Hassani government gave in to pressure from his corporate backers and privatized the corporation. Today, the GBB is a shadow of its former self. It's become a tool used by the government to circulate fake news and misinformation. So how did we get here? Where did it all go wrong? How can we tell when our national media has become state propaganda? Our experts speak on conditions of anonymity for their own safety. Here's disinformation and media expert Charles, who's seen free broadcasters built up by journalists and torn down by demagogues all over the world. 